views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us here. If anybody asks the question, what is the Social Justice Forum all about? Well, it's a forum that provides a deeper discussion on the issues as well as the inequities that many people face. We promote civic engagement as well as invite you to share your point of view. So we encourage you to stay with us. The Social Justice Forum starts right now. And welcome back to the show. The Opportunity Network is a not-for-profit organization that's providing underrepresented young people with the support, tools, and training they need to thrive in their college as well as their careers. With the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacting under-resourced communities, the Opportunity Network has launched in, I should say, uninterrupted, unstoppable learning, which is an open access learning platform. Now, the platform is designed to mitigate the learning loss and opportunity gap caused by the pandemic and is easily accessible to any first generation student and young person of color. And joining us now to share a little bit more about the information and sharing information is the president and CEO of the Opportunity Network. We're pleased to be joined by Eileen Koo. And uh, Eileen, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Wonderful opportunity to talk, and especially as we talk about opportunities, right? Uh, I want to get your take, though, uh, as COVID-19 has impacted so many people, obviously the work that you do has rather been ramped up. So share with us a little bit about the network and what you guys do. Yeah, sure. And so the Opportunity Network, we work with first generation young people of color to ensure they have the access, the skills, the training to pursue every college, every post-secondary and every, every career option that they're excited to pursue. And so we try to break down every barrier that's in front of them uh, that gets in the way of their ambitions. And so um, we launched uninterrupted, unstoppable learning early on in the COVID pandemic, because we knew that there were young people of color, first generation college bound students across the country that were going to have additional barriers to access and getting critical information and critical training to pursue their dreams. And when we talk about these young people trying to pursue their dreams, one of the things is college, of course. And we know that college is something that a lot of them are looking to go to and want to make it their best. But we know that virtual learning has also been the order of the day, right? So talk to us about navigating that and that whole virtual experience and how you've been able to wrap your arms around them in a time like this. Yeah, absolutely. So within our organization and working with our fellows, um, and these are the folks that we work directly with over the course of summer after 10th grade, all the way through college graduation, um, and they're New York City public school students, we found that connectivity was an issue. It was really unequally uh, distributed in terms of broadband. And so we knew we had to um, get hotspots and increase data plans to all of our students. And that also helped us understand that not all virtual learning was being adapted at the same pace or with the same level of innovation and creativity because teachers are, are woefully undertrained and resourced and be able to convert their learning environments into a virtual platform that also supports them. So what we wanted to do was uh, adapt all of our curriculum into asynchronous autonomous content that can also be used by teachers so that teachers and educators had reliable and high quality resources to engage with students on post-secondary learning and they, it didn't have to be um, only accessible through teachers and educators. So students themselves could also access it directly with relatively minimal broadband and also on their own time on any mobile device. Yeah, and obviously for students, it's a trying time. And when we talk about having that access to technology, what have you been able to find out in terms of those students that you've been reaching and, and, and touching? Um, have they had the adequate access or how, what's, it, what's it been like? What have you heard from them? Yeah, we've heard from our students kind of a variety of, of challenges when it came to virtual learning. I think first, if you think about hardware, I think hardware was inconsistently um, accessible through the New York public 
school system. And so I think the, the New York Public School tried really hard to get iPads and Chromebooks to as many hands of the students as possible, but logistically it was really challenging. And so um, our staff really supported our students in navigating that resource. And in the, in the places, in the cases where the hardware still wasn't accessible, we were able to fundraise and get hardware to our students. Now, after hardware is software and also connectivity, right? right. So, some, so if you have, say, assume that you have the hardware, but it could be old. That means if you're required to stream video content and if you're required to use um, new learning management systems that require um, updated operating systems, your old hardware is no longer a viable solution for you. Right. And so those two kind of can, came in hand in hand. And then also connectivity when everybody is at home, especially during the early half of COVID and now more so now, now that the numbers have gone up a little bit, more people are at home sharing the same broadband. Right. And right. so that means having a household of four, five or six people on one connection was not sustainable. And so what we learned that and we were able to uh, again through our COVID emergency relief grants support with additional data plans and also um, supporting with hotspots for our young people to be able to access uh, the internet on a consistent basis where they didn't have to share their bandwidth so much with other households uh, household members. Yeah. When we talk about uninterrupted, I mean, un uninterrupted, unstoppable, uh, two words that really stick out. Um, and give me this about uninterrupted, because there's some educational disparities that come and they're plaguing our students at an astronomical rate and even more with the COVID-19 pandemic. Talk to us about what you've gotten in terms of results and in, in seeing uh, some of these educational disparities and how these things have been playing out. Yeah. So thank you for noting the name of our new platform. And they were really inspired by the spirit of the young people that we work with, right? And so, so much of their daily lives, all of their entire day is navigating spaces, learning environments, workplaces that were not designed to help them thrive in the first place. And so that means that every day they're navigating spaces to problem solve, to communicate differently than, than their counterparts would have to be just to um, be taken more seriously, right? And so they already have these barriers that they've been pushing through and yet they continue to thrive in every industry that you can think of, right, years from now. And so we really took in inspiration from our communities and say, they've always been unstoppable, right? And our role is to break down the barrier so they don't have to be interrupted by something like a pandemic, although we know that there's going to be continued harsh hardships. And so one of the things that we learn from our students uh, in our communities is how can we as youth services providers redesign and reinvent how we spend time together. And so traditionally before the pandemic, we would use workshop settings to learn with one another, to compare notes. And so we were able to build community while we were learning. Now in this virtual environment, what we found that because so much of their time for learning is spent through the screen, we needed a different uh, mechanism to support the community building time and the engagement piece. And so to have asynchronous content that continues to drive learning and opening up live sessions for community building is something that the platform allows us and all of our partners to do. And so that's been receiving pretty positive, positive feedback from all of our, all of our partners and also our students. And when we talk about interactive and engaging learning, it's obviously the biggest component of this whole virtual platform, how one can be interactive, how can one be engaging? What's been the response of students? Do they feel like, you know, things are more interactive and more engaging? Or, you know, are, are we hearing what we heard in the part of some where it's like, oh, I just dread this, you know, because it's, it, 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 it's I just can't get into it. What, 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 are, you, what are you seeing? Yeah, um, we're still learning. Some of the early things that we learned is that we need to have short modules, right? Short modules that drive micro learning objectives. So we're not keeping any young person online in a particular module for too long because then you will lose their attention span and it, it will be you know, pretty boring and passive for a learner. And then we also chose a software that allowed us to build content that requires learner engagement. That means you have to click on the screen in order to get the next piece of content. There's drag and drop options for you to demonstrate your learning. 
There's multiple choice questions. There are hotspots on a graphic where you can explore what's actually on the screen. So the idea is that it invites the student into the process of learning through even through your monitor, as opposed to being a passive learner where you're watching just a video or watching a recorded webinar. Because what we learned that just watching and not actively engaging essentially will end in what you were saying earlier, where the young people just can't get into it because that's what they've been doing all day already. And so having these mini modules allows us to have live conversation time with our young people to be able to have conversations about the mini modules so that they can do two, both things. Um, and one piece they can do on their own time and the other piece they can do when we're live together uh, on a Zoom session. Talk to me about your young people. How do you get, in, how do you, uh, how they engage? How do you get them? Um, people say, listen, the opportunity network. How do I get a young person connected? Yeah, so thank you so much for asking that question. We're in the process of our recruiting right now. And so we work with about 250 public high schools throughout the New York City uh, area to work with guidance counselors, teachers, educators, and also our alumni and our current fellows to uh, host information sessions to tell them more about our program. And then we have an application process and we're looking for students who are the first in their families to go to college, right? We're looking for students who have a demonstrated financial need. And we're also looking for students who have demonstrated access academic aptitude because we at the end of the day we're not an academic program and so we want to make sure our students are coming ready to receive all the other resources that we provide and then we start recruiting for students right now they have to be current 10th graders and then we'll support them the summer after 10th grade all the way through college graduation so um, you can check out our website right now opportunitynetwork.org for more information on how to apply yeah. One thing I like is that you stay with your students, right? And you stay with them for, you know, not just the short term, but you're, you're with them for a long duration. Talk to me about that being a difference maker in, in terms of student achievement. Yeah, absolutely. So it's so important to us to stay with students, our students through key transition points. So we start with them the summer after 10th grade. And then, so that means we're with them in the early college exposure years. And then also during their college application process, the transition process, and then supporting them in persisting, right? And in the five summers that they're with us, we're able to encourage them to participate in paid internship opportunities, as well as leadership and enrichment programs. So the, the time that we have with our students allows us to build real meaningful relationships relationships with every single one of them. And it also has to allow us to have history and to learn together as a community. So as the world changes, as the future of work changes, as the workforce uh, continues to change, we can adapt our support services to be able to meet what the world is and also what our students need and also um, engage our students in having a seat at the table in shaping some of these conversations. And so in having to do, having done this longitudinal program for you know 17 going on 18 years as an organization, I'm really proud to say you know over 92% of our students graduate college uh, within six years. And then after they graduate, 89% of them secure career interest aligned jobs or graduate admissions within six months of college graduation. You talk about putting your hands on them around 10th grade, right? And that's a really, really important time. Uh, give us the value of being able to catch them that early and what that time frame means. Because, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about walking them through and you just get statistics about graduation and then jobs, you know, job placement, um, but it starts early. Yep, absolutely. And so starting in 10th grade allows us to be able to play a critical role in exposure. So we double down on exposure in that first year they're with us and also some foundational skill building. So exposure allows them to see all the possibilities in front of them. I think if we were to start a little bit later in the process in their high school journey, that many of them will have will be too late for us to expose them to other opportunities around colleges that actually fit uh, their long term goals their financial status um, and also their academic ambitions. Right. And so the earlier we start, the more that we can expose them to, to honor and support their sense of agency in making the right decisions for them uh, around post-secondary learning as well as career. So coming up uh, around the corner, we're in the beginning of January 2021, of course, uh, you talked about recruitment. Where are things going from here as we start the new year? 
Uh, we are operating as an entirely virtual program for this entire academic year, uh, like many of our peers. And what we're excited to do is we've seen also a surge of uh, virtual volunteerism. And so what we've been able to do is kind of hit the gas pedal in exposing our students to as many professions out there as possible through uh, speed networking, through career exposure roundtables, through uh, a new series that we have called Opportunity Talks, where movers and shakers around the world that also share um, elements of their identity with our young people can share a little bit about their journeys and so that our young people can see versions of themselves in the future. And so we have tons of virtual programming planned for our young people. And we continue to think through how we emerge from the pandemic, um, relying on the best of what's good on, should stay on virtual, as well as bringing back uh, the in-person proximity and the connectivity that we're all looking forward to. Yeah. Uh, what are you hearing about getting back in person? Uh, what's 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 uh, what's the time frame looking like for you? Have you heard anything new about when you plan on getting together back in person? Uh, not yet. So we, you know, our academic year and our and our um, organizational fiscal year goes till August. So at the at the minimum, we're staying virtual until the end of August. And I think um, come May and June, we're gonna kind of recalibrate and understand what are the numbers out there right now? What's the vaccination uh, schedule? What's the requirement for our young people, if at all? And so there's so many pieces of information that's outstanding to help us anticipate what's next. But our prim primary and only priority is to make sure that all of our young people are safe. And whenever we introduce in-person programming, we're not putting their households at risk uh, because so many of our students live in multi-generational households. Uh, so give us some uh, final tips before we leave. Um, if people want to get connected, what do they do and how do they go about doing it? Yeah, sure. And so uh, we are really excited to enroll young people and also institutions on the open access platform. And so you can visit opportunitynetwork.org slash uninterrupted to learn more about the platform itself, but then also uh, to submit your interest uh, in enrolling on our platform. Mm -hmm. About how many people do you have working with you at the Opportunity Network? Uh, right now, so we have, uh, we serve a, thousand, a little over a thousand students in our fellows program. We have a partnerships program where we build capacity at other organizations across the nation. And so through that program, we work with over 40 institutional partners serving about 7,000 students. And then on uninterrupted, we currently have interest from over 70 organizations that serve uh, over 7,000 students. And so we're in the process of enrolling them onto our platform. Uh Awesome work. Eileen Kuhn, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, the Opportunity Network, Eileen Kuhn sharing with us a little bit more about that organization. And of course, if you want more information, you saw the information that's at the bottom of the screen where you can be connected to them. And uh, hopefully uh, you can find out more about the Opportunity Network and create a possible opportunity. All right, we'll be back. Got another segment coming up right here on the Social Justice Forum. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. to the show. The Ladies of Hope Ministries is a New York-based not-for-profit with a vision to end poverty and incarceration for women as well as girls. Their mission is to help disenfranchise and marginalize women and girls transition back into society through resources as well as access to high-quality education, entrepreneurship, spiritual empowerment, advocacy, as well as housing. 
Our next guest, who was recently appointed as the Goodwill Ambassador for Social Justice of Incarceration Reform for the United Nations, has worked and continues to work relentlessly in her fight for the dignity, decriminalization, and decarceration of women and girls. And joining us to tell us more details is the founder of Ladies of Hope Ministries, Topeka Sam. And uh, Topeka, good to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Darren. This is a great honor. Well, it's a great opportunity to talk to you, and it's a great honor to talk to you in the work that you're doing, particularly when it comes to um, women in incarceration. We know that um, incarceration, or incarcerated women uh, have a lot of struggles, and uh, you've done a great job in terms of really highlighting some of those struggles and really calling for decarceration and forming your uh, Ladies of Hope Ministries. But for somebody who's not familiar, please let us know a little bit about Ladies of Hope. Ladies of Hope Ministries uh, looks at our work through two pillars, one direct service and sustainability and the other policy and advocacy. Uh, it is critical that we are fighting and doing that through legislation, uh, making sure that we're giving policy recommendations because that's the only way we will be able to physically decarcerate. And when I say decarcerate for people who may not understand that term, release people from prison. Um, but we also have 1.1 million women who are presently engaged in the criminal legal system, whether it's through pretrial probation, parole, and or physical incarceration. And so we're looking at how do we stop measures from women and girls going in? How do we make sure that we're creating alternatives to incarceration? And then lastly, making sure that we are decarcerating. And so again, with the policy and advocacy piece, what I tell people all the time is that I can't think about fighting for someone else or even fighting for myself if my basic human rights are not met, which is safe housing, an equitable opportunity through job, employment, career development, education, and food. So right. our programs address that on the direct service and sustainability side. So we have Hope House, which is a safe housing space for women and girls, which is presently in the Bronx. We're scaling that through the five boroughs in New York City. Also, we're presently in New Orleans, Louisiana, and going to scale that through several states in the country in the next year. Also, we have our Angel Food Project, which is a project that partners with Instacart, Fairway, Wegmans, Whole Foods, and other supermarkets in the city, where we get fresh bags of donations of groceries seven days a week, 365 days a year to families impacted by incarceration. One of our newer programs are Pathways for Equity, which is a program we have partnered with Virgin Unite with to make sure that we are urging companies across the globe to make sure that they are giving people who have criminal convictions second chances through real career development, fellowships, paid fellowship opportunities, and opportunities within corporate America. Um, there are 70 million people in this country who have criminal convictions. We know that having to check a box is a barrier, um, though again, we've had legislation where it's passed and stated that, hey, we can remove the box and so a person doesn't have to check the box and they actually get a conditional offer of employment, what happens then they still have to consent to a background check and consenting to the background check so often because New York being one place, but many of the states across the country are at will employers. And so when the background check comes back, it shows that a person has a colorful past, immediately the conditional officer office the conditional offer is, is rescinded and a person doesn't have a job. So that's yeah. why we um, have our pathways for equity. And then on the other side, through the policy and advocacy, we have our Faces of Women in Prison program, which is a program where we train women and develop women how to use their voice to share their experiences for policy and legislative recommendations, but also as a career, as a public speaker to get paid. Um, so often people tell their stories, reliving those messy parts of their lives, and then they have to unpack that trauma and aren't being compensated. So we're making sure like anyone, any other expert that is using their experience to share that they're being compensated through our Global Speakers Bureau. And then we have our Probation and Parole Accountability Project, which teaches people what their rights are while they're under surveillance. You know, I talked about earlier the 1.1 million women who are presently engaged in the criminal legal system. There are 2.2 million people presently incarcerated in this country and 4.6 million people who are presently under surveillance through pretrial probation or parole. And so we're addressing that population. So we created a Know Your Rights Guide so that people understand that while there are expectations of them, there are also expectations of their probation and parole officers and how to build healthy relationships. So people aren't actually just always um, getting hit with technical violations, um, and being sent back to prison because we do know that the majority of people who are sitting in our prisons and jails in this country are there because they can't afford bail and or because of technical violations, not new charges um, or new arrests. 
And then lastly, <laughs> our last program um, that's also launching this year is our Epic Ambassadors Movement. Um, that's a program that's been funded by Arnold Ventures and recently the NFL. And with that, we're going to be, again, training women how to use their voice, but also how to draft and write policy um, who have been impacted by incarceration, both women who are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, family members and girls, partnering with local elected offic officials to move that legislation, and then partnering with lobby, um, lobby firms so they can become registered lobbyists in their state. Again, wow. another way to have an equitable opportunity within a space that not only we're directly affected by, but also that um, we want to change. Can I ask you a question about personal experience, right? Your personal experience, you've, you, you spent time incarcerated. Now you're letting people know what it is on the other side, right? From both the inside to the outside. Give us a little bit about that, because when we understand living life on the inside, coming and transitioning to the outside, there's a lot of things that, you know, if not, recidivism happens, right? And so what are some of those things that we may not be so familiar with who are people who don't have experience in the area of incarceration? What are some things that we can pay attention attention to, uh, to know about the life of a person that comes out and what those needs are coming out to be successful. Absolutely. So like I said um, before, that people coming out, they need support, right? And so the Know Your Rights Guide for us was to let people know what to expect. But outside of that, housing, whether, you know, when I think about when I went to college, for example, and I left and I was doing great when I actually lived on campus, right? When I decided to move off campus because I thought I was grown is when life started happening. I had bills to pay, <laughs> all these other things. Um, but it's the same thing, whether you're in college, right? You go to college, you come back into your community, you need somewhere to live. Whether you're homeless and you're expected to have a job, you need somewhere to live. Whether you're just any person in this country or beyond, you just need somewhere safe to live. And so housing to me is the number one need for anyone transitioning and or just needing to have a healthy lifestyle. Um, and then, you know, when I think about barriers, right, there are 44,000 barriers for people who are returning into their community from prisons or jails or with criminal convictions. And so through that, there's, you know, um, life insurance, for example, we can't get life insurance. Um, there's uh, certain jobs that you can't get. There's, um, you can't, Second Amendment rights are taken because of gun permits. You can't vote in many states. Um, you cannot register to vote or participate in the voting process. Um, there are certain well, travel restrictions. You can't, for, for me, um, I had a probation officer that told me every time I wanted to leave the Bronx where I presently lived, going to Brooklyn, I had to ask for permission. Like I thought it was, it was ridiculous. And their supervisor said it was ridiculous. But at the time, they thought that every time I left one borough to the next, that I needed to call and get permission prior to going. Um, every time you try to travel out of the state, you need permission. So, you know, we call them, they have these, these forms it's called travel authorization forms that mm -hmm. people have to travel with. We call them slave papers because it reminds us of that time. Um, you know, the language in it, everything. It's just as if people are tracking you at every single step of the way. And so it's yeah. incredibly difficult. And then to think about reunifying with your family, getting your children back, um, wanting to pursue higher education. It's all of these things that you have to worry about and, you know, making sure that you're not reviolating because your probation officer has a bad day, you know? So it's all of these things, unfortunately. Well, I want you to know that a lot of people are asking questions. You've made headlines yourself. Um, receiving a presidential pardon from President Donald Trump. Uh, talk to us about how the pardon actually came about. By God. Um, and that is, the, uh, that is an honest statement. I did not know that I was going to receive a pardon. I didn't apply for the pardon. There is a pardon process where you put in an application request it. Um, I received a phone call from Alice Marie Johnson um, saying that Jared Kushner called her and told her that they were going to support my, um, my pardon uh, to give me a full and unconditional pardon. And so there were people like Daniel Loeb um, who supported and made phone calls on my behalf, Jessica Jackson, um, who again supported and made phone calls on my behalf because he was doing pardons. And so because of that, they called and gave my name and you know my work uh, speaks for itself, the dedication that I've committed to this space since my release from prison in 2015 speaks for itself. And so I'm just grateful to God. I know God can use anyone. 
And I'm just grateful that God used President Trump and that I can get my full rights restored back um, and do some of the things that I talked about just a while ago that I could not have done, um, even with the fact that I'm in this space doing the work um, and it, am a national leader on this on this effort. Right. And we know that even though you are, uh, you've been pardoned by the president, I know that you have a voice against what you've seen lately. Uh, talk to us about that, um, because I want people to be very clear. Like, you know, you did receive a presidential pardon, but there are some other things that you definitely want to do. And, I, and one of the things I, I, spoke, I spoke to was the fact that you uh, had an article, an op-ed in the Washington Post, and uh, that op-ed said that Trump pardoned us, but pardons don't replace criminal justice reform. No, absolutely not. They don't. And, you know, I'm also a senior advisor in New Yorkers United for Justice, where that's what we do. We um, urge the governor in New York State to make sure that they're doing a comprehensive criminal justice reform package to make sure that we're releasing more people from prison. And so, you know, I heard you mention about what I've seen in the country um, as let's just be specific at the Capitol, um, you know, these last few days. And the way that I see things, you know, it is completely unfortunate that we are that we are having to relive all of the um, biases and injustices that people of color have faced, you know, way before my life is, has even been thought of or existed. Um, you know, I always say that what I know is I <laughs> I don't like everything about any one person. You know, like there's people in my family I don't love everything about. I love them, but I may not love everything about them. Um, what I can say about President Trump was that when there had been uh, criminal justice reform and prison reform legislation that was uh, proposed to this administration, this president administration, that they took hold and that they signed the First Step Act. And over 14,000 people have been released from prison um, because of it. And what I will say is in the last several decades, there has been no other criminal justice reform legislation on a federal level that has passed that has released that many people. With that being said, is that enough? Absolutely not. Because when you think about where the majority of people are in this country, where it comes to incarceration, they are in the state, city and county jails. And so it is the governor's responsibility to begin to pass legislation to do clemency's pardons on a state level that will also help to release people. But I mean, you know, we should be able to roll back some of the injustices and the harm that has been caused over decades. And that has not been done. And so, you know, I'm more hopeful that as we move forward, while people are seeing, uh, you know, the great disparities, you know, it's kind of in your face now. You know, we can no longer say, oh, no, that's not happening. Like Black people are just bugging out. That's not true. Everyone is seeing how Black people are treated very differently than white people are treated um, as it relates to even what we saw at the Capitol. If there were Black people who were outside that Capitol, there would have been a massacre on Capitol Hill. We do know that. There's no denying that. Um, however, what I, what I, what will I say that we're at this place in this country because of President Trump? No, we're at this place in this country because of the history that we've had, that we have not took, taken hold of. Um, can I say that because of what has happened, that that also has elevated and given people more uh, power, if you will, or the freedom to begin to speak out. And, you know, I, as a black woman, wish I had that same level of freedom. You know, unfortunately in this country, we just don't. And so, you know, the way that I see that we even change the racial dynamic in this country is by making sure that people have equitable opportunities. You know, when you're changing capitalism, when you're making sure that there's equity across the board, then you have a different playing field, right? Like when my pocket looks, it, when my pocket is matching that of my counterpart, then my power is a little different. And so, you know, I think that we should really begin to talk more about that, you know, and less about like, what's happening. Let, let, let's put our money together as a community. Let's make sure we're reinvesting in community, community-based organizations and the people within our communities so that we're not having these type of issues and that we are more armed with education, with access to resources and with opportunities. Walk me through a little bit about women in prison. When we talk about some statistics, I got some very telling statistics about women in prison. And this, I know, fuels the work that you do. 86% of women in prison are survivors of sexual assault. 80% of women are uh, in prison are mothers. 77% of women in prison are survivors of partner violence. And 50% of women 
in prison suffer from serious mental illness. Now, if you'd have asked me before prepping for a segment like this, did I actually know these statistics? My answer would have been no. And I think that that's not just my answer, but I think that's the answer for a lot of people across America. Give me a little bit about um, like what we don't know and how your work is actually trying to bring some things into balance. All right. So. The numbers that you said, that's right. But even when we're looking at, those are the reported numbers, right? There's still a stigma around sexual trauma, violence, partner violence. And so there's many issues and instances where it's not even being reported, but it is happening. When you're looking at the amount of women who are presently being sentenced to life in prison, they're being sentenced to life in prison, double the rate of men today. Um, when you're looking at the number of people with mental health issues, you said 50%, it's actually over 90% of women who've been incarcerated reportedly have mental health issues, which range from anxiety, PTSD, that can all go up to something more severe. And so the numbers, again, like I said earlier, they're consistently escalating. Um, the way that I see to change these things, again, are just one, bringing awareness, which is what I'm doing now, having this conversation with you, being able to have conversations like this on other platforms, sharing the information so people get activated, upset, and wanna make change. Um, but then providing, again, equitable opportunities and resources to women and girls within our communities, because I'm a firm believer that when we change a woman, we can change the world. And wow. so often we, we think about even with our brothers who were incarcerated, you know, and they say, well, the numbers of men are more incarcerated than the numbers of women, even though it's growing up, you know, it's going up. But I say for every man that is incarcerated, there is a woman, there's a mother, there is a daughter, there's a grandmother, there's an aunt, there's a girlfriend, there's a baby mama, there's a mistress, there's a pen pal. There are so many women that are attached to that one brother who's incarcerated. And what we don't often talk about is that families are also incarcerated when you are incarcerated. So like my time was difficult, but I know how much more difficult it was for my loved ones. And so, you know, I think that as we are creating this balance to your point, that is critical that we're also creating a national conversation around the numbers of huge impact. And so one in every, it's one in three adults are uh, impacted by the criminal legal system through an incarcerated or formerly incarcerated loved one as well. Before we go, how do people get in touch with uh, the work that you're doing, your ministry, and, uh, and uh, how can they play a part? Sure. So the organization is the lohm.org, T H E L O H M.org. If they want to learn more information or if they want to give, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so your deduction is tax deductible. You can text the word the LOHM 2020 to the number 41444. That's another way to plug in, get information, be a part of our newsletter, know what's going on. If you have things that you want to donate, whether it's time, whether it's opportunity, whether it's clothes, whether it's food, um, you can always give us a call, email us at info at the LOHM.org. Um, and then also what I would say is make sure that you're reaching out to a loved one who's incarcerated. Again, I talked about the numbers. And so, so often it's that person in our family that we kind of write off. Um, especially in communities of color, you know, that person has been in and out of prison, they struggle with different types of issues. And so at times we just are just, you know, we, and I say we, because I'm still a part of that community, regardless of whether I received a pardon or not, um, you know, we're, we're just kind of left to fend for ourselves or left to die. And, you know, I encourage all the viewers to call, I'm sorry, call, we yeah, call your prisons, um, make sure that your loved one is safe, especially now in COVID, especially now in New York, the numbers are increasing. I think they said it was over 3,000 reported deaths happening in New York State right. prisons right now. Um, see what you can do for compassionate release and getting people out of prisons. Write your governor, your local elected official. See what they're doing. Open opportunities within the community for people to come home and just be a good neighbor. I mean, at the end, you know, I am a woman of God and I believe in what the word of God teaches me. And that is to love thy neighbor as we want to have ourselves to be loved. And so, you know, our people who are in prison are the least of them. And it's important for us to make sure that we understand that 95% of all people who are coming home, who are in prison are coming home one day. And it is all of our responsibilities to make sure that we are creating safe communities, not just for ourselves, but for the ones who are returning into them. We got to leave it there, but thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forums. And we certainly want to continue to follow the work that you're doing. Um, so make sure that you uh, continue to stay connected with us. And of course, we'll definitely be staying connected with you. Topeka, Sam, thank you so much for being with us. 
Thank you so much, Darren. I really appreciate this opportunity. Happy, happy new year to you and all of your viewers and God bless you all. Bless you too. Happy New Year. All right, listen, taking a quick break here on the Social Justice Forums. We encourage you, don't go anywhere. We're coming right back right after this. to the show. Throughout this pandemic, New York City has received limited assistance from the federal government to deal with the difficult financial times. The COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged communities in the Bronx. Within days, small businesses were shuttered, mass layoffs, and strained households, as well as food insecurity exploding throughout the district. Today, these issues continue to disproportionately affect their community, resulting in even more pain as families struggle to survive the pandemic. Our next guest has taken the initiative to build partnerships to find and deliver food with local volunteers, as well as fighting for additional grab and go food sites and providing resources to access workforce development opportunities. Here to share more information is the district leader of the 82nd Assembly District Part B and candidate for the 13th City Council District, Marjorie Velasquez. And Marjorie, good to have you here. Hi, Jamie. Happy New Year. Great to see you and great to hear your voice. And, uh, what a year it's been. Yeah, and it has been it has been a year, but you know, thanks be to God, we're all here and we're able to talk about it on one way or uh, one way or shape or form, even though it's virtual and we're not in studio. Glad to have you with us. I want to talk a little bit about this whole issue of food insecurity. Uh, I know that it's front and center for you as well. COVID-19 has definitely exacerbated the issue of food insecurity, but I know that you're trying to do some things. Talk to us about what you've learned about food insecurity, or even if you can, give us a better picture of food insecurity within your very own district. So when I launched my mutual aid back in, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, it was to facilitate a need, right? And I think as the pandemic has stretched as long as it has, we've seen that there's no real face, right? There's, the need is there and I think in the past, people have thought, oh, only people like this need it. No, there's a real need throughout the community and it's folks that are your neighbors. And what I've seen that it's the most beautiful thing, it's neighbors sticking up for each other. It's neighbors, I have a friend who has a chicken coop and she brings eggs to folks. And mm -hmm. it's that niche, right? It's that small thought of thinking of your neighbors and giving out, right? And then there's another neighbor who has access to bread and so she brings it. So. What we did initially uh, was reach out to folks, what do you need? Um, do a small little um, food shopping for them in Spanish. So immediately my brain calls like compritas, right? Um, compras, that's what we call it, right? Um, so we shop a little compras and then it expanded and expanded greatly. And for me, um, why I'm even running is this one particular person who reached out. She was one of the first people to reach out and she called twice. And so I understood the urgency. I show up and after I delivered, I get a text message in response thanking me and basically saying that this was the only food that her household had for the night. And if anything, they were not going to eat. And this is a mom, a dad, and a nine-year-old child. And it absolutely crushed me um, to a point where 
I realized that we need to do better. We need to give more to folks and we need to actually um, galvanize the whole community. And so what did I do? I reached out to my partners, right? And I have different partners in government and I have different community partners and we organized. We organized to make sure that we had food on the table for, for our community. Um, and not just within my district, we expanded throughout the Bronx. And now what you've seen is more forces joining up to say, you know what? Let's also provide fridges, right? So I'm very proud to have um, teamed up with the Allerton Fridge, um, the Parkchester Fridge, um, right by the Oval in Hugh Grant Circle. And it's these important steps, right? You see the immediate need and you understand that there's more than we could all give um, if it's something small, so small as to making the phone call to organize the food drop-offs, if it's something a little bit bigger like a donation to the groups that are actively accepting funds like Loving the Bronx, who's actively um, participating in the Grow NYC, also giving out food in the fridge. Uh, it's meeting the, meet, the, the groups together and merging them together and understanding that we're a bigger community than what we think. And we're not just one and we are all, and we got to do this. Right, and you're raising your voice as a, a leader in that community. You're also running for the city council. Talk to us about that because you're seeking to see what are the things that you're seeing within your district that say, listen, you know what? I want to be a part. I want to go to city council and do something. Well, this is not, not my first rodeo, if you will. I ran back in 2017 uh, on kind of the similar pyramids, right? That our education system here needs to be fully funded. And what we've noticed, especially during the pandemic, is that our children are left behind. We don't have all the technology that we were promised. Our children don't have the accessibility to proper Wi-Fi, to proper devices, uh, to a proper facility uh, when they return. Uh, when we're talking about transportation, we're still in a transit desert. Thank God that we're trying to get this ferry service up and running now um, within the district at Ferry Point Park, but it was a fight. And we still have accessibility issues within our trains and we need to find better ways to get our folks going. Um, and lastly, gotta build our businesses back up again. Our small businesses are shuttering down. They were shutting down beforehand. This pandemic has made it even worse. Businesses as old as 40 years are now closing their doors because they don't have the proper support, not just from the federal government or the state, but the city has really disinvested in them. And it's not fair. Um, and it's taking a real meaningful approach. For me, it's literally going day by day, reaching out to the small businesses. Do you know that these grants are available? Do you know that this is available to you? And it's also holding folks accountable and holding people that are at the decision-making table and say, where are you? What are you doing? And why have you let us down? So as we look right now across the city, we see, <laughs> definitely some failure in those areas. And then we could also look on a national level and see some failures. Talk to me, I mean, I gotta ask your perspective on the events of last week. We saw the storming of the Capitol. Uh, your thoughts as you watched in real time, uh, the Capitol, the United States Capitol, the seat of democracy, uh, literally be done away with almost by domestic terrorists. So, um, you're going to have to give me like a couple of two seconds because um, it's still very real and very raw for me. Um, I have both friends and family in D.C. I um, started off that morning very excited, very happy because it's January 6th and Three Kings is very big to me and my family. Uh, Dia de los Reyes, uh, we've celebrated my whole life. Um, and especially with that Warnock win that was epic that morning that we were celebrating and it looked like Ossoff was uh, gonna win as well. And it was before it was called it in the afternoon and we were celebrating um, and it was reaching out to friends and uh, celebrating and then it changed. It changed when I got a text from a dear friend saying that they were being removed from the Capitol because there was a bomb threat. And then it literally escalated those text messages to what we saw unfolding and It's tough. It's tough to understand that five lives were lost and it's, it could have been my friends. It could have been my family and it's a betrayal. What we saw, it's a betrayal against us all. If you call yourself an American, what we saw is folks trying to go against the very nature of what makes us American, the diversity 
of the folks that work there, um, our representatives. Um, and just at the end of the day, who we are as a people, as a government, as, as, a, uh, as the strongest government, you had this insurrection. Um, folks need to be held accountable. Right. I think, you know, when we think about crime, think about crime for a moment, right? And when you think about crime, one of the things that you hear about crime is uh, when it happens in certain neighborhoods, this is the, the familiar phrase, oh, you know, we're such a good neighborhood. You know, this never, this never happens here. We're totally surprised. And then we saw this insurrection happen. And when we saw this insurrection happen, I think a lot of people said, you know, we're America. Uh, we're used to fighting against uh, foreign terrorists, but now to have domestic terrorists the way that we do, um, how do you feel? You know, you're engaging in a political process right now. You're looking for elected office and you're looking to seek a seat in elected office in a democracy that's not so democratic. It's also who I am, right? I am a Latina. I've been in spaces that were not designed necessarily for me. Um, and speaking up and making sure that I'm not just there for myself, I am there for a community is what leads me through right? Um, definitely being in rooms and hearing things said as if I don't hear or understand them. Um, it's taking that initiative and saying that I'm not just fighting for one, I'm fighting for all. And I think it was an eye opener for many folks who, like me, look, you're a New York City kid, you grew up in the Bronx, right? Like your life is diverse, right? You have friends from everywhere. And so you wouldn't understand it necessarily. So when someone tells you uh, what they're fighting at, for, right? And that all these discrimination things happen, you don't necessarily see it. But now clearly people saw it firsthand on Wednesday that there are groups of people who want to deny my existence, your existence. Um, and that hurts. And it, and it hurts in a, in a big way. And what do we do, right? Uh, because that's not American. American is coming from all walks of the world and saying that we believe in this country to develop us all. This is a country that gives us an opportunity to be together, to be united. What we saw was a group trying to divide us and, and it's not what we are and not who we are. And we're gonna fight that in our own way here, which is building up. And that's how I fight back, right? I fight back by, empowering our voices to making sure that we are fighting for what belongs to us and that's proper education, it's proper transportation. That is the ability to exist and to develop our community and give our community the priorities and the things that they need to be successful. And what does that look like? It looks like holding folks accountable on every level and saying we need more because we deserve more. We've been out during this pandemic, my community members are some of the top essential workers out there. They need the, the respect and they need to have a life with dignity of what they took on last year. And we need to respect them for that. What we saw Wednesday was a lack of respect. It was a betrayal on us and everything that we fought for so much. You mentioned running for the city council before, you're running again. And so I'll ask the question, what do you do this time differently? Well, the landscape is different uh, to begin with. Um, we, A, um, built upon our work in 2017. Uh, we also are in a different world where we have ranked choice voting. Um, my opponent at the time, uh, both during the primary and the general did not secure 50% of the vote, which especially in a highly democratic district like mine uh, was very surprising uh, to not garner that 50% of the vote in the general. And what does that mean? It means that new voices are empowered to run. And that's why you see ranked choice voting now bringing a lot of folks running in 2021. It's like 280, 88 uh, candidates running in New York City. So that's city council seats, that's mayor, that's everything all combined. And it's a beautiful thing to see what democracy looks like. And it is, you know, to run the, a race that People believe. I think people saw my story, right? 2017, mm -hmm. me running against big power players, me running against big money, right? It was more than a million dollars invested in a race, which was never heard of before. And we came really close. And that spoke to our commitment for the community. And it really spoke to what our group, 
our volunteers believed in. And certainly now it, it we've built on that, right? Uh, we have the support of Senator Biagi. We have the support of former council member, Jimmy Vaca, just to name a few. And it's to add on to building our community, making sure that our community is our interest, not special interests controlling our community. Yeah. And you talk about investing in people. I want to know the platforms. One of, the, one of your platforms is investing in people and not really investing in millionaires. And, and you really want to see the money go towards the people and, and the resources go towards the people. Uh, give us a little bit of your breakdown as to how you see that playing out, investing in people and not millionaires. Investing in people, what does that look like? Um, it looks like building on our infrastructure, make sure that we have an opportunity to have the best um, abilities and the best offers. When I ran back in 2017, I remember this one young lady like saying that she had to quit her job in Manhattan because it was taking her about an hour and a half to get there. It's not fair. And so now that we have this ferry service, we're allowed folks to you know, have jobs in the city and come back home. But it's also about what are we doing creating jobs here locally? It's what are we doing with the infrastructure that we have, right? And so many opportunities. Now that all these storefronts are vacant, why not have an ability to allow for pop-up shops? Why not make sure that these small groups get together and have an ability to rent out those spaces? Uh, what we've seen, um, especially with the commercial real, real estate is some real, Nasty is going. I have a friend who has a, um, a beauty parlor and beauty parlors were shut down until June, July. And she had her landlord literally calling her every single month saying, you still owe. And she's like, look, I'm not open. I'm not bringing any money. How can you charge me? And he's like, I don't care. You're going to have to find it one way or another. And that's what I say. You got to hold folks accountable. Um, look, I understand this is tough on everyone. We have mortgages, we have rent. There has to be a meeting of the mind. Um, there has to be an opportunity for banks to actually make sure that they're not giving fines, they're not giving penalties anymore on late uh, mortgages because it's just the right thing to do. We bailed banks out in 2008. It's now time for them to step up and make sure that they're taking care of our homeowners. They're taking care of our businesses in a real substantial way. Not just like, hey, this is a little something here or I'm just gonna eliminate these like $2 fees. No, it's really it comes back to microloans. It comes to real investment in our communities. We talk about investing in the community. Obviously, that's the reason why you decided that you wanted to run for uh, the city council. Talk to us a little bit more before we get out of here as to how people can find out more about your campaign and where people can get connected. Sure. Um, we have a website and we're on all social media. So our website is mvelc.nyc. Um, and our social media is the same, all those handles. So on Twitter, it's at mvelazNYC, at uh, Instagram and at Facebook, it's the same. So feel free to follow us. Uh, we are gearing up our fellowship um, program this week. Uh, so if you want to volunteer, feel free to reach out and sign up. Today is the last day of our fundraising. So if you have a couple of bucks that you would like to send, if you're a New York City resident, it is match eight to one. So a $10 contribution can lead up to 90 because we add the 80. And that's what helps us too. It's to get our mission and get our movement going and uniting folks and letting everyone know that we're still here and we're here for you. Marjorie Velasquez, we got to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us and being with us here on the Social Justice Forums. Thank you. Take care. All righty. We want to thank all of you for joining us. That about wraps up this edition of the Social Justice Forums. Very informative guests, very informative information. We encourage you to stay connected to us here on Channel 67. Also, you have the opportunity to watch us on the web. Uh, you can do that at bronxnet.org. And don't forget, come on back next week. We'll elevate the conversation, have a bigger discussion. I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, and thank you for watching the Social Justice Forums.